looks like somebody's been here already this morning. There's some fresh tire tracks, interestingly enough. Hello, boy. And so we have a magnificent male lion with one round, roundish belly resting up on a termite mound in the sun once again. The animals seem to be enjoying lying right out in the open this afternoon. Last time we saw the Birmingham boys was, of course, the dramatic scenes that played out. Was it yesterday morning? Time flies. Feels longer, in a way. But yesterday morning, Vim and myself were witness to an incredible scrap. Almost a family argument, I think, is the way that we've decided to classify it. Oh, is that not very comfy? You are lying with your head downhill, which can't be terribly comfortable. So we had the... Birmingham boy is going to meet up with the Inkahumas. Now, we don't know exactly what it was that sparked off the disagreement. I'm relatively certain that it was Amber Eyes's diversionary tactics. She might be going into estrus, but she was definitely behaving in a very flirtatious manner with the males. But the rest of the Inkahumas with the cubs were definitely on edge. They were on edge from the moment the Birmingham boys poked their heads up over the hill. And it sort of escalated into one serious disagreement with the Birmingham boys scrapping with each other and the lionesses behaving incredibly defensively and actually aggressively towards the males, I think, uh, because there were cubs around. Now, I suspect that those sorts of scenes actually play out more commonly than we get to see them, but it was something that we have, I have certainly have never seen on these live safaris before. And it really gives you an idea of the true raw power of these creatures. And yet, at the same time, they were basically flat-handing each other. It was There were no serious injuries, a couple of scratches here and there. But when you think of what these animals are capable of doing, and we've seen with that poor buffalo, with their powerful teeth and jaws and claws, they definitely hold back. They pull their punches. But our battle-scarred Birmingham males Bear with me one moment. I just have to call this in on the game drive comms. Uh, afternoon stations in the north. There's one Maduro and Gala uh, just, just to the west of Triple M, uh, south of the Balanites Junction. There's two vehicles on lock from the west and myself in this position, but I'll keep you updated. Uh, that's affirmative. He is on our side. He's on Juma. Sorry, everybody. Just chatting a little bit on the game drive comms to let everybody know that this mail line is on Juma rather than on Arethusa. There we go. He's just arrived. <laughs> Aubrey is here. <laughs> Standing by. Sorry guys, we have to play a bit of Tetris here. I'm not sure, Brent. I'll stand by on that one. Brent would like to know if this is the... Male lion is the one with the limp. And I, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not 100% sure which Birmingham boy this is. I, I mean, all of them seem to be sporting some kind of limp at the moment, which is relatively typical of a dominant male lion in an area like this. And Brent just wants to make sure that it isn't the one that he's been tracking. Well, Paul has suggested that this is Birmingham boy number two, which is entirely possible. He's got those scars around his nose and then just up along his cheekbones, which should be relatively 
and distinctive. But of course, male lions constantly have fresh scars, old scars, healing scars. Uh, their faces are a map of their trials and tribulations. But Paul thinks this is Birmingham boy number two. I definitely know it's not Birmingham boy number three because he's got the skin infection all, all along his side and his elbow patches. I'm not sure if this... I assume that Brent has been able to see that it is the male with the limp just judging by the tracks that he's been looking at. Now, I know that Brent did have a male lion this morning, so this gentleman could well be him. Dispatch Griffin, who is our newest safari addict, or one of our newest safari addicts, would like to know how many terms we have to use for lions on the radio. He's heard flat cat and fuzzy, and now whichever r word I just used. So dispatch, the typical word that we will use on the game drive comms is ngala, which is the local word for lion. So ngala, um, often we just refer to them as male lion. I called him a madoda ngala. <laughs> Our cats are doing a lot of shuffling at the moment. That was a very graceful reposition. The dispatch, I often refer to him just as lions in English on the game drive comms. Um, I refer to this gentleman as a madodangala, which means a man lion. It's not actually the, the correct term. Apparently the correct usage in terms of, the, of Shangan is manuna ngala. A madoda is a man, a human man. Oh, so exhausted. And flat cat, we often say that we're leaving them flat cat. And the reason that we do that on the game drive comms is to tell the other vehicles what that animal is doing at that particular time. Whether they are on the move, which in which case it changes whether or not people are going to come and see the sighting. How, if they're far away then, and they know that the animal's moving, then they might not try and get here. Or they might try and race quickly. It's just keeping the other people updated as to what the animal is doing. It's not enough to just call it in. You've got to explain the positioning and the situation. Because, of course, a sleeping lion is a very different thing to a hunting lion. Dispatch, I'm sorry, apparently you thought that you heard us calling them fuzzy on the Game Drive channel. I don't think that's a term I've ever used. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever called them fuzzies on the Game Drive comms. <laughs> um, has James ever called, is James habitually calling the lions fuzzy on the Game Drive comms? Not that I know of. <laughs> Ryan's just making me laugh. And Bill, last night, of course, we were went to bed accompanied by the cacophony of sounds that is the male lions roaring their way through Juma. Bill, yes, it does keep us awake at night, but are we going to complain? Most definitely not. And what often happens is you kind of wake up absent-mindedly, you go, oh, lion, and then you go back to sleep again. And it's far nicer to go to sleep accompanied to the sound of lions roaring than sirens and traffic and all kinds of things that other people in other, in other places have to put up, to, up, up with. And it's always exciting actually because you wake up at one o'clock in the morning and you go, oh, the lions are roaring, I wonder if we're going to find them tomorrow morning, what are they going to be doing, what are they doing now, are they still going to be on our traverse area? It's fun. I know Brent has described it as the daily crossword puzzle that we do. It's our equivalent whenever we wake up in the morning and we go tracking. And I think that is a brilliant description of what it is that we do the first thing every single day.
Now I want to try and puzzle out exactly when this male lion decided to pop out in this particular spot. If he is the same one that Brent is tracking, and if he was the same one that Brent was with this morning, we'll try and figure all of that out. But in the meantime, let's go and hear from the man himself how his tracking expedition has been going. Which is what we shall do. We'll just wait for them to spend some time in the sighting, enjoy a position close to his head, and then when everybody moves off, then we will shuffle in and have a nicer view once again. And those enormous paws of his. have an answer to the mystery that has been plaguing poor dispatch and confusing me no end, which is why we've been referring to the lions as fuzzies. <laughs> I'm having a little bit of a quiet chuckle here, entirely valid question. We're not calling them fuzzies on the game drive comms, although I'm really, really tempted to start calling them fuzzies on the game drive comms now. But. Um, <laughs> What we are saying is the opposite of what I was talking about when I said he is a Madoda or a Manona Ngala. We refer to them as Mafazi, M-A-F-A-Z-I, when we're talking about a female lion. And again, like Madoda, it is actually more like a lion woman, because Mafazi is a woman, a human woman, but it, it's something that has become incorrectly utilized and... and over time almost bastardized in terms of the way that we talk on the radio. So my apologies to Dispatch and to all of our other viewers who are convinced that we've been calling the lions fuzzies. Uh, perhaps this is a is a, a misconception that you some of you have had for a very long time. <laughs> it is a fuzzy ngala and it is a, that means the female lions rather than the males. <laughs> I really like the idea of calling them fuzzies now. <laughs> Stations, I've got one fuzzy here. Lovely. I think that's a perfect way, and it's pretty descriptive, isn't it? With their manes around their heads. You know, there's so many things that we do absent-mindedly, and of course, because we spend so much time with our viewers, we start to take certain things for granted, and we also do certain things without realizing that we're doing them. And a lot of that is sort of typical game drive protocol that a normal guest wouldn't necessarily have any insight into. Um, and then the other, of course, is ducking out of the way of the camera, which had one of our viewers convinced that we were perhaps terrified of the wild animals walking past or trying to hide away from them in some way, because every time we'd see them, we'd duck. And that, of course, is just to make space for the camera to move without getting our heads in the way, which we still do on a regular basis, and I think it frustrates the cameraman no end. And every now and again, you get a gentle head shout to tell you to move. Now the, the nice thing about these particular male lions and the, these winter evenings is that our male lions tend to start to become more active earlier and earlier in the evenings. And hopefully with the absence of any of his buddies around, he might decide towards the end of the sunset safari to start lifting his head and maybe even giving us one or two earth-shaking roars to contact call to the rest of his coalition. I think that the Inkahumas are somewhere still on Juma. But they definitely led us on a very merry dance this morning when we set out, set out and about tracking them and trying to figure out exactly where it was that they had gone. Hi guys. Hello everybody. And we've just got Ephraim from Cheetah Plains joining us as well. And we're all having an opportunity to have a look at this lion. I'm going to talk nice and softly. 
um, especially because there are other people very close to us, which means that we just have to, I just have to keep my voice down so as not to disturb their guest experience with this magnificent male. And it's important to remember, and it is something I was taught when I was training as a guide, is that no matter how much time you spend with these animals, and fortunately for, for myself and for the rest of the, of the guides working at Wild Earth, we've never had a major problem with getting bored or taking the animals for granted. But I was taught very early on that you never know where your guests have come from. You don't know what sacrifices they have made to get out on a holiday like this, or whether this has been a lifelong dream of theirs to see a male lion. And never underestimate, no matter how many times we see them, the power that a sighting like this has on people when they first come and visit. And there are those massive paws that just yesterday he was using to batter about and fight back. Powerful, powerful weapons. The size of a man's hand with cracked heels. One of the most incredible structures in a lion. When we were looking at a, a lion skeleton, there's a, there's a full lion skeleton at Voyatella Lodge, a lion that died of natural causes that's been beautifully put together, all glued together, and it's, I find it absolutely fascinating. One of the most fascinating things is, of course, that their sternum does not attach to their ribs at all in the same way that ours does. And that in turn actually allows for all kinds of anatomical adaptations. One is the increased lung capacity because of course the lungs, the, the ribs can expand further. The other allows for those deep bass roars because it allows for the passage of a muscle that runs from the diaphragm to the larynx and pulls the larynx down, deepening the sound of those roars. And then of course also making space for those enormous meals because the li male lion is capable of eating close to a fifth of its body weight in a day. An enormous amount of meat. If this chap probably weighs, he's quite, the Birmingham boys are quite small lions, I would guess at around 200 odd kilograms. Now that would be 20, kilogr 20 kilograms of meat easily in one sitting. Just in one sitting, that's not counting the three days that they may gorge themselves on a buffalo. Now they truly are extraordinary animals. And again, as I said, we will take an opportunity to reposition a little bit later, but first we're going to let the other guests have a chance to sit and enjoy the view of the front of his head. And the interesting thing about the Birmingham boys, and Steph, Steph has a theory which I think is entirely valid and probably is not just his theory, but he has a theory about the effect that the Mapojo coalition had on this area and he says he feels as though the impact and the reign of the six Mapojo males that came in in the sort of the 2000s is still being felt today. And he said it was because they had such an enormous influence over the area. They killed so many other males. They created such a vacuum in terms of male lions that Steph thinks that there's a whole shift in dynamics at play, even years and years later after the Mapojos have long since been slowly, one by one, killed off by other lions. And it's an interesting point, and we see this, this effect with the Birmingham boys now. They have this enormous territory that extends all the way from Mala Mala right up into close to Manuleti, probably into Manuleti as well, into Kruger, we have no idea how far it extends into Kruger, and then all the way towards Elephant Plains on the opposite side, and Simbombili, and I mean it's just their home range is absolutely enormous, it must, it must equate to close to, I would guess, at 10,000 hectares, which is a huge amount, and what that means is 
now that they have established themselves, and they have established themselves very, very effectively as the rulers of this area, they've had to sort of, they constantly split up in terms of having to cover ground and mark and patrol those territories. And recently, what we've seen with them, because that was, that was sort of the, the results about five months ago, but now things have totally changed because now they've got cubs. And I think it's, it feels to me as though they're spending time in a slightly smaller area, a smaller home range that they are now patrolling and taking care of. And I think that's instinctively a sort of a, a tightening of the barricades, so to speak, around their cubs, both from the sticks and from the Yunkahumas making sure to keep them safe. And it just goes to show how amazing the instinct of a male lion is. Because that's not learned behavior. There's no way that they learned that that was what was required of them to keep those cubs safe. It's pure instinct. And when they first arrived, they were almost bumbling and inexperienced. And filled with testosterone and quite a lot of aggression, which in the end resulted in the death of at least two Nkuhuma females that we know of, that was de definitely caused by the Birmingham boys, plus one of their sub-adult female cubs, which seems a bit short-sighted, because at this point, her sister, who is now the youngest, no, not anymore, the youngest adult female of the Nkuhuma pride, is now ready to mate and is mating with the Birmingham boys. But there was a great deal of chaos and discord when they first arrived, and they've definitely matured into responsible male lions, if one could call them that. Now, while our lion snoozes away, and while we wait for an opportunity to enjoy a slightly better view, so far, I don't think that he's moved terribly much. Standard lion behavior on an afternoon like this afternoon. And just look at those scars all over his face. I'm just going to take my earpiece out for one moment. I thought I heard alarm calls. I'm just going to double check. I'm not sure where Brent's following up on those alarm calls. So I'm just going to listen. I hear something, but it's not alarm calls. Might might have been a vehicle or vehicle noise. No, it's all gone quiet. Okay, false alarm. I thought that I did hear something. Pop my earpiece back in so that I can hear all of your wonderful questions. We were in the process, or I was busy talking about how beautifully battle scarred he is. And I always think it makes a male lion look so incredibly interesting. There's the stories behind every scar and every cut. And he gives us a really nice opportunity to, first of all, examine the color variation that's happening just on his face and on his mane. He's starting to go, the manes of all of the Birmingham boys are starting to go slightly darker now. There is a noticeable difference, there's a huge difference between when they first arrived and now. And I'd actually love to get hold of some of the screenshots. I must go back and look for screenshots of each of them, sort of a before and after. Those first days when they arrived, all clean and no scars and beautiful blonde manes, very pretty lines, to the way that they look now, which is older, wiser, and with a lot of experience and stories to tell. And it might be very interesting to actually have a look at the before and the after. I found, um, as social media has been doing, I found somebody's screenshot from a year ago popped up on my Facebook, as social media does, with the Matimba male lions a year ago, or just over a year ago now. And it seems like so much has happened since that tumultuous time. There he's got a bit of a fresh scar on the right-hand side, or the sort of the top part of his nose. Slightly fresher than the others, and I think that may well have been from the other morning. I seem to remember one of the male lions came out with an injury there. And just an update, we know that one of them moved around. There were at least, there were three of them with us yesterday morning. One of them is now here. The other is on Mala Mala Cheetah Plains boundary, so around there. 
and then there's some more separated somewhere off on Ju either on Juma or on Buffelshook. So they are really incredibly spread out. He is basically on the western fringes of their territory. The other is all the way on the eastern fringes, and then the other two somewhere in between. So it's exactly what we were talking about before in terms of the level that they've been separated. And I'm sure at some point, I'm being hopeful now, at some point he is going to give us a display of a lion's roar. And we spoke about the fact that it wakes us up at night and that we're not complaining. But there is nothing more spectacular than having a lion calling right next to your vehicle. The sound travels through you. The bottom of the car vibrates, your chest vibrates. And whenever I had guests with me and we had a male lion doing that next to a vehicle, roaring next to a vehicle, we used to make them turn off all of their lights. And one of my guests, who has since become a very good friend, her very first experience with that, we turned off all the lights and the next thing I knew she'd moved from the passenger seat, which was closer to the lion, to basically sitting in my lap out of sheer terror. But at the same time, she then went home, packed up, sold her business and came back out here and is now living in South Africa. So part of that definitely had an effect on her life, a major, yet an enormous effect on her life. And something else that we can talk about just while we've got this close view of his face, which is aging male lions, or aging lions, and it will start to answer Tasha's question, but before we get onto that, have a look at the black line of his mouth. The aging lions, one of the things that starts to happen once they reach about seven or eight years old, and you'll see it on the Matimba males, but not so much on the Birmingham boys, is that they start to droop. They get jowly, I think is probably the best way to describe it. They lose elasticity, so that black bit at the bottom starts to sort of get floppy and loose. Now we're looking at his nose, which is also darkened, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> which also darkens with age in most lions, although it is possible to have a lion whose nose doesn't change color completely. <clears throat> oh, excuse me lost my voice there for a second. Noses start to darken with age, but as I said, you will occasionally get a lion with a pink nose throughout their entire life, lives. And then, of course, we get to the mane and the growth of the mane. And Tasha wanted to know at what age will a male lion's mane start to darken. The answer is it's not, def it's not defined. So it depends, first of all, on the area that they're in, and it depends, secondly, which is connected to their genetics. Uh, in certain areas, male lions' manes grow faster and darken faster. In this particular area, it seems as though, at least for the Birmingham boys with their genetic stock, that it was around five, five and a half, that their manes have started to properly darken. Oh, oh my goodness, we have a head up. What have you seen, boy? Or heard, perhaps? Something has attracted his attention. Can you give it one second and then reposition? Just want to see what he's looking at. Amazing how they go from fast asleep to intently focused in a split second. What's that, boy? He might even be hearing roars that I can't hear with my human ears. It's distinctly possible, of course, because his hearing is so much better than ours. And it's starting to get a bit darker and a bit cooler. Hopefully he will decide to <coughs> start to move. Oh, we've got a very good sign. We've got a yawn. Now, generally, when lions start to yawn, yawn, okay, we're going this way, are we? Fair enough. When lions start to yawn and lick their feet, it often is an indicator that they're about to move. And he's giving us a perfect demonstration now by moving. He might just be getting up to relieve himself, but let's just check. Let's just make sure. That 
is magnificent. I'm stopping here just to let him decide where he's going to go. Intense, look at that look. Wow, that was a very intense look. Huh, and that is that. Isn't he absolutely stunning? He's very intimidating at this level because he's sort of eye level with us which makes him particularly since we are straight in his eye line that stare is truly impressive and he's not giving me <laughs> looking down on the ground and as much time as we get to spend with them every now and again they give us a very well, they just give us a reminder of how truly powerful they are and how wild they really are. And that look was one such example, staring straight into my eyes. And eye contact is important with animals. There's a lot of things that are passed by the... not of messages that are passed through the eyes. And for animals that rely purely on visual communication, they can't speak to each other, plays a very very important role which is why you find yourself if you're ever standing down a lion charge which hopefully you never will have to do eye contact is essential but it is an it's an incredible feeling when they're staring right into your eyes there is an intensity about that that I cannot begin to describe Is that Hannah it's lovely to have you on board Hannah is nine years old and a fellow South African and Hannah I hope that um, throughout your life you'll be able to have lots and lots of opportunities to come and either visit us here in the Sabi Sand or go to the Kruger National Park or any one of South Africa's amazing game reserves. Hannah actually wants to know how long a lion can live for. It depends if it's a boy or a girl. For the male lions their lives are relatively stressful and they tend to have slightly shorter lifespans than the females usually around the average is about 11 years old. They can, leave, they can live older than that, but the average is sort of 11 years old because often what happens when a male lion gets old, he doesn't necessarily die of old age, but he's actually chased and weakened by other male lions. Females can live a little bit longer. He's seen something. Sorry, Hannah, your question got interrupted, but that was absolutely amazing. Beautiful. Hannah? And then the female, sorry, <laughs> to get back to, we'll talk about the lion roaring in a moment, but let me just finish Hannah's question. The females can live up to 14 or 15, even up to 16 years old. 
but that's very old for a wild lion. And most lions, of course, in captivity will live a little bit longer, but our wild lions have tough lives that they lead. I'm going to reposition, and I'm actually going to go just a little bit around so that we can get a nice view of fully of him, and also so that I'm less, I don't know, he's just giving me, his tail's not thrashing, just the way that he's looking at us suggests to me that he would prefer it if we just repositioned ever so slightly. He might even give us another roar, so I'm going to do it quickly, but while we do, let's go over to Brent quickly. So, we were close to where those monkeys were alarming and we got here really quickly, but it's just this really difficult time of the day to spot something. I'm searching around here. It's too light for a spotlight, too dark for good normal vision. And the monkeys are generally looking in this direction, so we're going to keep going up Rebecca's rod. And sometimes the monkeys can see them from hundreds of meters away. I haven't seen any tracks yet either. I'm really sure it must have been a leopard in the area, more than likely Karula. Gives us something to look for on the sunrise safari. Unless we find it in the next few minutes. But I think since it's World Elephant Day, it's time to show you some incredible things. So I went and did a little snoop around. Well, yeah, this is just more fun than anything else. So look at that. That's uh, me filming forest elephants in Gabon in a swamp. There we go. And uh, one last picture before we head back to that line. I wanted to show you uh, the largest elephant tusks ever recorded, and they were from Tanzania. But there we go. Look at that. So over 10 feet long, weighing 250 pounds, this one, and about 240 the other one. There we go. Amazing animals, elephants, but speaking of other amazing animals, and from Brian and myself on Elephant Day, let's go back to a male lion on the beach. Stay with him for the last few moments of the sunset safari. We'll stick with him. Oh, thorns. Oh, VR rig. Thorns and VR rig. VR rig is now in a quarry bush. Ah, thorns, quarry bush. Thorns, quarry bush. There we go. Now, there's nothing like the feeling of a male lying male lying, male lion roaring right next to one's vehicle, as I said before, and I'm so glad. Now that I'm looking at him, there we go again. Contact call. Feel that through your feet, Vim. It's incredible. It really is. It's such a fantastic feeling. The power behind that call. Let's take the light down for now. I absolutely 
I have this memory of the Birmingham boys when they first arrived here, all five of them calling around the Mahindra. I took some of the staff out to go and see them after we finished one of our sunset safaris and we all went to go see the male lions and all five of them on quarantine started roaring together and I must say it's one of the most spectacular experiences I've had out here in the bush. patiently for the response <coughs> of the other lions, whether it be females or males. And those first few soft calls were contact calls before the full-bodied roar came out. It's almost like a warm-up session before releasing the real thing. Absolutely, it does give one the ch give one chills to hear something like that. It never gets old. So yes, perhaps this male will wake us up tonight with his calls. I don't think we will begrudge him that, though. It's a magical sound. There is nothing else on earth that is like it. And whilst today is World Elephant Day and we've had some amazing moments spent with Brent and those elephants, our male lion giving us an, not a reminder, I don't think any of us need a reminder, but certainly just a little insight into just how special all of the animals are out here in South Africa and within Africa. The wildlife is simply outstanding and that applies across the globe. But for us, our passion is here in the African bush. To spend it with a male lion for the last few moments is truly special. Come on, boy. You've got two minutes. Two minutes to give us one more call. Come on. You can see the focus that he's looking off into the distance. Waiting to hear back. That was the sort of human equivalent of a missed call. Now he's waiting for somebody to answer him. the grace and the power of that body. You can see how hungry he is, the flap of skin. Tonight he will be hunting or looking for the females to steal food from. One more roar. He's been spotted already by some kudu. There we go. And now we are coming to the end of our sunset safaris. I'm going to do a very quick thank you because I think he's going to roar again and I don't want to talk over it. So thank you to VM as well as to Kirsty and Rebecca in Final Control. And a huge thank you to all of you watching across the globe. I'm getting the thank yous out of the way because he's going to call for us again. We're going to let him walk off into the darkness at the end of our sunset safari. Come on, boy. Little piddly contact calls. There we go.